Thanks for staying with us. So we have Dr. Akanimo Odon on the show today. He'll be discussing a variety of national issues like youth unemployment, career development, the new wave of young people going overseas, and most importantly for him, the role of universities and government in nation building. Welcome with us, Professor Akanimo Thank Odon. you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Show. Yeah, same here. It's really good. So before the show, we're talking about you know vaccines and all that, people, take, people taking responsibility, and I'd like to link that up to Government helping young people take responsibility for this unemployment. There's a lot of unemployment in the land. It's like there's confusion on how to engage these young people. people. How best do we use these able-bodied youth that is the, the, the largest part of our population in Nigeria? What's the best use of that? You know, interestingly, it's, I think many people make a mistake think that, think that government can do everything. Everyone knows that. Internationally, that's the case. But in, and in some cases, people actually think government needs to do incredible things for things to happen. Yes. Sometimes it's just a fundamental idea around strategy and placement and alignment. So I'll give you a very simple example. So you talk about employability of young people. You can almost talk, I mean, you can't actually talk about unemployability, you talk about, you talk about unemployment. Mm. So you can, you can have job opportunities and a young person can't actually apply for it because you're not qualified to in the first place. So there's a fundamental issue around unemployability. Okay. It's a capacity for you not to be able to apply in the first place. Also, a separate issue around unemployment. So let me give you a very simple example to, maybe to kind of get, get you around this. So <coughs> universities, all they do, um, every student, whether you're a first degree student, uh, uh, doing an uh, undergraduate program, a master's or, or PhD, there's something you all have to submit. That's a research proposal or a research uh, dissertation. In international communities, developed economies, because it's a mandatory requirement for graduation, whether you are undergraduate or postgraduate, what they've done cleverly is tie that aspect of your graduation to employment. What do I mean? Now, around every university, so um, I think I, I was in Unilag just last week to go and deliver a, a, a talk okay, at their colloquium. And I just decided to just make a count. With, within, uh, I think, I don't know, five minutes drive as we were approaching Unilag, I was just counting as we were driving in just because I felt like, and I counted about 250 SMEs mm. before I got to Unilag. If you do a one kilometer radius projection, there is a minimum of 1,000 SMEs within and around the lag. That's a lot of SMEs. Now the question is this, I think the point is this. Big companies don't have so much problem. They have too much money. In fact, they even have R&D department. The guys who have problems are the SMEs. Because to write for someone to do a small research is thinking about how much money do I have extra. They, are very, they have limited resources. So how about you did a simple mapping? So instead of a young student doing just an over the head, if you like, dissertation, which most of them do, I did the same thing. Tie a dissertation to respond to a question or a challenge by an SME down the road. Mm. Do you know how many SMEs have problems? I'll give you an example. You know, if you did a small mapping and said, okay, how many SMEs want uh, someone to manage the social media handles? Yes. It looks easy to you, but for some SMEs, that's a big struggle. But there are crazy students who, they, are, who are like, they become experts in managing social media accounts. Well, let that student map it such that it's responding to that SME need at the same time developing its capacity to meet a demand. In Lancaster, where I'm based, um, the way it's designed is you have these resident companies. And every year, the university will do an email to SME say, OK, send us all the problems you have. We're writing to a proposal. So if it's, uh, OK, I want to know my competitive advantage. I want to know how much energy I can save. All these are simple, simple questions, but that's a question that can be a fundamental premise for a student to respond to in the dissertation. Mm -hmm. Instead of just plucking one research topic out of space, mm -hmm. and you ask you, so what did you do with the topic? Uh, it's gathering dust so on the shelf. That, so let's, let's, let's build on that a bit. So a research question from an SME, let's just say you sell clothes. Absolutely. And your issue is that how do I scale? How do I increase from where I am to the next level? Fantastic. And we give that question to a student in and business do, and do that research. So she, he or she has done the research. What, what next? So the person has done the research, but obviously the person is over submitted, submitted some kind of a response to so a question the SME has asked for. By something that responds, in the form of a proposal or a write up or a dissertation, they pass their qualification. You know how many SMEs who see that kind of a result? First and foremost, what you've done is you've built some incredible confidence mm. in the student. Why is that important, though? Because if you meet many, many employers, the biggest issue they have is that students don't have 
work experience. Mm. So now I can say, well, I'm a student consultant. Why do you say so? Well, I just finished a research project, call it one nice big name, and I was able to respond to the problem that SME had. I was able to address it, yeah, it and, so and it I fixed the problem. Yeah. So fundamentally, it's a, a, a confidence build by being able to respond to a need. But secondly, right away, the student knows, well, wait a minute, if that SME had a problem, I wonder how many more SMEs have the Not same a problem. problem. So now you put a framework for a potential enterprise development on the back of a simple premise that is designed around their actual mandatory work of something in research. Hmm. That's on second level. But, but even more interesting, the SMEs should now go, wait a minute, if that student could do that, and maybe he wasn't even paid, because it was a simple research, he would do on his mobile phone. I wonder what else that student can do. Mm. That, that SME now, so, so, so if you look at it, it's, it's like a boiling pot of different scenarios that impacts together. Look, at Unilag has got over 45,000 students. That means every year, Murayo, 10,000 students are submitting one research. Kilo day, <laughs> they will have a job. So it now helps me understand that, you know, the um, success of the tech startups, because they seem to be responding to um, issues and problems on the within. Ground. So people are confusing tech for, oh, that's the new thing, but Instead, it's more about the problems that they are solving. So that's why they are successful. As a matter of fact, you know, it's a really good point. It's, it's important for everyone to know. Every career on earth, whether you are a tailor, designer, every career is framed fundamentally on your capacity to solve a problem. The reason why that, 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 that executive is, is paying you for that job is because you are filling a gap. Mm. And which is the reason why careers that are not sustainable are careers that don't innovate on finding more problems to solve. Mm -hmm. So that's the fundamental premise of all careers, is because you are solving a problem or taking advantage of an opportunity. It means, therefore, that when young people see themselves as, not just, not just uh, I'm a student, but you are a potential solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. Look at Paystack is a mega company in Nigeria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what has Paystack done? It's just fundamentally solve a problem mm -hmm. of money transfer. Yeah. It's a list of, why, why is a lecturer a lecturer in a university? It's a simple premise, it's solving the problem of, of ignorance. It's because some people don't have knowledge, and that's the reason why your job becomes important. Mm. So, so you're very correct. It's not, if, it's, it's not because it's just ha it, it's the tech companies. That premise is, remains the same in every other sector. Do you know how many pharmacy shops you walk past within the university? Imagine if you just saw the pharmacy student, just to go and check out how, what, what, what is the place of work environment within pharmacy. Right now, it's only done theory in classroom but you are exposing them to the fundamental work spaces and how these things actually happen. So it's, it's about solving Great. problems. Yeah, so I, I feel that our uh, educational system, it's mostly abstract. Yep. So we like the big English, we like to have the certificate, I am a this, I am a that, and then when you are put in a position where you can solve a problem, you're not able to think on your feet. Apply. And you cannot even apply the knowledge that you have. True. And I feel it's a failure on the part of our so-called lecturers and mm. school authorities. How can we get them to understand that the, uh, uh, the international uh, standard, standard yeah. and the Yoibo the countries are going as far as they are going because they understand the value of solving a problem. Problems. How do we get them to even change their mindset in the first place? And actually, it's so, it's so bad, it's so ingrained, and it's, it's actually very frustrating. And um, I mean, it's, it's an institutional issue. For it to happen, there, there needs to be a basis of benefit on why lecturers should innovate enough to be able to see themselves as children solvers. Everyone knows about the term publish, publish or perish. But that is because, forgive me, so, the basis of promotion of most lecturers across Africa is based on your capacity to publish a paper, mm. okay? Because the premise is around publishing a paper to get promoted. So that's the reason why there's been different levels whether, I mean, some do incredible job, but because that, that, that loophole is the fact that people now navigate and look for data by hook or by crook, because once the paper is published, you're promoted. Mm. Now, imagine mm. there was a retraction and there was a realignment where you're saying, okay, well, you're promoted based on how many in companies you engage, or you're promoted based on how many problems you solve, or you're promoted based on how much impact you make, what do you think is gonna happen? Mm. We'll get Everything will just change. So that mm. means fundamentally the premise of driving this should be driven by policy, okay? Mm. That's the first level. Second level, and this is even more important, is the fact that you can't, you can, I mean, you can't expect a lecturer who is not entrepreneurial to teach entrepreneurship. Okay, so that means there's a problem of lack of capacity to do the place in the first place. Have you ever asked yourself, the lecturer who is teaching lecturing, did he want to lecture in the first place? No. 
he already has so much work to do. He has to write uh, the report. He has to mark script. He has to lecture. He has to apply for grant if he sees one. He has to report to this person. And my goodness, the number of committees and subcommittees that they join. <laughs> so on top of that, you're not wanting to be, to be solving extra problem. I, I have enough on my table. <laughs> <laughs> that means that there needs to be some kind of a reprioritization in a sense that's driven through policy, strategic alignment, but also a, a structural formation that makes it easy for lecturers to actually innovate. But, I, but it's, I, 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 think, I think for me, it's a question of the fact that if you tie benefits and reward to what you want, then things change very quickly because mm -hmm. there's no reward system to back up that's creating those impacts in those spaces. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for opening up the roads in the universities. Lecturers who would make a student do research and they see the quality of research, still it's change the topic and, and publish. halfway into the project, publish it because of promotion and then oh. build the student and mm. ensure that he, he leaves school frustrated. But thank you. I always wonder the role of universities in developing mm. countries. Mm. The example of the SMEs that you picked uh, is just one angle. True. I'd like you to expand on Nigeria is an oil producing com country we're trying to get uh, you know, diversify economy and a lot of other things. We just continue to open more universities now. They're talking about opening a university for petroleum alone. The other time, they're talking about another the university culture. for aeronautic. Uh, we have the one in Kaduna. As if we don't... <laughs> no one is doing. it that... Is the solution universities, more universities, or let's just close it down until we're serious about students coming out with the problems of inabilities from where we call our higher institutions. There's something I noticed. When we're studying law, every lawyer as a lecturer could practice. It's because there are new laws coming out, and you cannot stay in the university and know them without practicing. Yeah. And every other lawyer outside does not have to combine practice with any other sure. thing. But as a lecturer, you have to. Can we do that to every field? Mm. So that there's this competition of... Uh, uh, no first class in my school, no on my course, and all those, all those mm, nonsense like will stress, stop. Yeah. So there's a distortion. It's a really good point you raised. So I remember some years ago when the, the federal government set up, like, I think it was eight or nine new universities, I was excited. Um, and the reason was because, obviously, the higher education demand hasn't been met by supply for a long time. As a matter of fact, I think every year, over 1.9 million Nigerians apply for jam, through JAMP to get into university. But the current carrying capacity of Nigerian higher institutions is about 800,000. That means every year there's a million people or more looking for where to study. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a problem around the, the disconnect between education supply and education demand. But on top of that, the fact that so, so that so creating more universities might cater for that. So that's the first thing. Second thing though is the fact that um, there's a, 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 mis a mismatch between the demand in economy and the supply in universities. So what do I mean? So you see, for example, I studied zoology back in the day. Okay? And I remember I walked into the class, and I, and I wrote this as, as, as a, a blog on my LinkedIn account. People were laughing, but it was true. So I wanted to study medicine, but I got into zoology, a study of animals. I'm thinking, ah, this animal, animal kingdom. So I remember walking to the class, and then I was thinking, um, so there are about, I think, about 50 people in my class. And I'm thinking, okay, so how many zoos are there in Nigeria? This is my myopic view on naivety. <laughs> and he said there are only two, one or two zoos. And in fact, one of them, the lion is dying. <laughs> so I know I have no hope. So that means I'm in competition with these students in my class for these few zoos <laughs> after we... <laughs> <laughs> After we graduate. So there's a question of naivety, and that's, that's zoology. Okay? But guess what? They've not innovated that course. It's now called environmental biology. It's in change of nomenclature, but what's the mismatch? The mismatch is the fact that now you have other courses like agriculture. The government has just moved to divert our economy spend into agriculture. You know that every university in Nigeria, especially as long as you're more than two or three years old, have a faculty of agriculture. But less than 10% of agricultural graduates actually do anything agricultural. Mm. So, so, so that's the mismatch. So while you're having surplus in some cases, you are having absolute um, uh, deficit. deficit in other, other locations. That means there has to be a structural understanding of where are the gaps and how do we map the gaps. So I'll give an example. Nigeria is a top um, movie producing co country. Not the wood is a, it's a big deal, OK? But do you know how many universities in Nigeria actually offer a top-notch master's in film production. I mean, you are in the media space. Mm. There are less than five. Yes. But there are over 170 universities in Nigeria. So how can we be the biggest supply of movies, or produce movies, in, in Africa? And yet there are only five universities that can fit the technical dimension of those spaces. So I can go on and on. It is the, is the, is the mismatching mm. that is the problem. Hmm. You know, well, that's where I always share this story, I mean, that when, when, we, when, we, when we build the, uh, because many of us in the, in the entertainment 
there should be just kind of learned on the job. Yeah. You know, nobody really taught you how to do this production um, set. I mean, the, when, we, when we built the um, Wake Up Nigeria set, and I was so excited because we designed it, we, put, we got the people to the carpenters, and it was such a beautiful set. I was so proud of what I had done. Like, you know what, this is fantastic, my team, you know. And I told the MD, and it was on the phone, he was arriving the next day, he said, Mariel, called, good job, and I get to Nigeria, I'll see it. So the next day, he came to the set, and I was so proud for him to see it. He said, Mariel, what rubbish is this? <laughs> this yeah, is okay. horrible. Shukua. You can't have white walls. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, God, see how fine I'll try my best. Yeah. No, it's for TV. You can't mm. have white walls. Mm. That's basic technical information that, that we don't know. know. We mm. just knew that. Know. Just do the beauty. That said, be beautiful. Yeah, well, so no. you were like, no, take this yellow, this kind of orange, you know, changing the colors, and then it popped. Because mm. on TV, the colors would pop. You can't yeah, have white walls. So it's that Simple little that information that we didn't know that. We just like, build a set. Mm. So you have schools, but are not teaching us how to be graphic artists. We're not teaching how to be good um, producers, good mm. script writers, good set designers, good self build. These are things, these are various jobs gaps. that you can actually create that yeah. are gaps within the industry. And there are people plugging into plugging those gaps. Yes, so yes. now we'll have like film schools, mini small yes. schools, schools trying to um, you know, cover plug, the gaps. Yes, those yeah, gaps. plug those gaps. And that's why people are asking now, and I think that's why it's a conversation in Nigeria. Is university education that important anymore? Mm. Since it's not meeting my needs, I can go to all these little um, institutes that are meeting my needs. Maybe skills. it's better. But for the trouble now is the fact that you, you, you use the word many. Mm. Universities by structure are massive, yeah. they, should, they should have bigger impact if they've got the right guidance, structural alignment for this to happen. But I think Maria raised a really good point, which I want to just emphasize quickly. So, is that, so that, that thing around the, 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 the conflict between higher education and vocation, okay? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now you might find the fact that universities don't actually offer courses like script writing and so on in that case. But I, I did a small experiment because I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a researcher by heart. So I started investigating across different Nigerian universities, even African universities, Kenya, Nairobi, uh, in, in Tanzania, and so on. And this time I come into a room of students, final year students, third year students, I ask them, okay, so how many of you have something else you love doing, which is not your course of study? It's always 95% and above have their hands up. Mm -hmm. So I give myself an example. In my year one at University of Benin, I knew I loved writing because words come easy to me. You could combine words together and it was a flow. And people ask me, how did you just put that together? I said, I don't know, but it just comes <laughs> naturally. Okay? But let me give you an example. Can you imagine I knew I loved writing, but I was studying zoology, study of animals. But can you believe for four years at University of Benin, I never visited the English department, not once. Mm. How does that make sense? Mm. So that means it's almost like there should be a policy, really, that every student, when you're doing a course of study, state specifically what else interests you that you love doing. And this is the beautiful thing about it. A, sec a second research I did now showed that. I started interviewing pro uh, SME professionals, so yeah, young uh, professionals who have their own SMEs. And so in a room of like 200 SME owners, so young guys, I said, how many of you set up your SME based on what you studied at university? Less than 5% of them mm -hmm. sort of the SMEs. But when I ask them, how many set up your SMEs based on an interest or passion you love? Over 90% of them said that was the case. But then I asked them the actual killer question. I said, but how many of you have gone further to develop knowledge or some extra courses in that thing you set up your SME on? The numbers dropped down to 5%. Mm -hmm. what, what does that show you? It shows you that there's a huge resource of inherent talents, innate skills that is gone through university environment. That's actually the, 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 the bedrock of societal development, but it hasn't been enhanced. But look at the beautiful thing. There is no single university in the world that precludes a student from sitting down in another class that's not your class of study, mm. your course of study. So if I'd known then, I should have been sneaking into go and take English classes while I was in the University of Benin. Absolutely true. Combining with the animals. Okay. So maybe I can speak better with the animals. You never can tell. <laughs> I want us to touch on the issue of those traveling abroad because we are yeah. losing young people. They don't even they, they, they don't even aspire to be anything in Nigeria anymore. They just, just want to go abroad. So we are doing everything to see. Okay, mm -hmm. does the university in America can they allow this course? Yeah. Can I get? Can I transfer? Can I do this? They don't. They have no. They have no plans in Nigeria. <laughs> we are losing these huge numbers. And even then, they go. Some of them don't even bother coming back. Mm. So what can we do to so, stop this trend so and reverse this trend? I was, I was trend? speaking to a young man. 
And he said, talk, talk, talk. Guess what? I said, what happened? He said, I've sold my house. This is a Nigerian guy. I've sold my house. I've sold my land. I'm coming to the UK for my master's. I said, um, so which area is the master's? He said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the UK. That's not as long as, as, long as I'm living here. So now we have a problem, OK? There's a huge deluge of people kind of moving to Canada and moving to the UK. Obviously, for better economic uh, status, which is understandable. But having said that, though, I think that that's where I think the government should step in. Because I think it's, I don't mean step in terms of, you can't restrict them from going because if things are better, they will move. Mm -hmm. But also a, a note of caution for young people traveling overseas. I live, I've lived in England for over 19 years. And trust me, it's not any better there except you know what you're doing. There are mm -hmm. people who won't tell you, but I can assure you they're struggling even in the UK they're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding your purpose, your perspective. It's about planning what you want to achieve. You can't go and spend... 15 grand in pounds, and then after you finish, start looking for work. Then, then now you're in, at a fix. You can't come back to Nigeria because they, 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 they're thinking you are enjoying yourself in the UK. Now you have you got yourself in the fix in the bubble. So my trouble is, it, it's what the, the economy actually portrays, and people are leaving. And you can't blame them that they're leaving. Let's talk about the long-term um, advantage or disadvantage of this living. So an average black man or Nigerian lives with the knowledge that they have. They solve their immediate problem. True. They live the societal problem. So the next person follows the line. Live, 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 live is solving one person's problem. problem. The knowledge that we need to change this country Collective. is outside. It's actually true. So, you know, so where is that part of patriotism? At what point, where, where is that breaking point that everybody will wake up and realize that let's Kukuma sit down and have this conversation on what we need to do mm -hmm. and what we need to force to, do, to be done and the talks that we need to do Pastor Podio Emadi, I'm not a Christian, but I've loved him since university days for having the talk, mm. for the organizing platform. The, the platform. platform. Mm, the platform. So you force that conversation to start, that's where he stops. But everybody, can you people do something instead of me? If I take my family today and leave, we live with that. Mm. You you know, know? But, but interesting, I guess the question is, the question mm. is, so if you can't stop them from leaving, can you encourage them to come to back? Come back. It's, it's yeah. one or the other. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be coming down physically. Mm -hmm. I see, interestingly, mm -hmm. I live in England, but actually over 95% of my work is actually in Africa. Mm -hmm. People wonder, how do you do it? But that's, that's, that's actually my decision to do that. And the reason is because I've understood clearly that careers are built on your capacity to solve problems. Mm -hmm. In the UK, there are very few problems in that sense. Mm -hmm. You sit down in a, in, a round table, in a round table like this, Just and you have people are having the conversations. And a prof will say, so let's write a new proposal to solve a problem. Okay, not about this problem. And somebody will say, no, no, don't worry. They, they, they solved it last week. <laughs> and it's okay, but let's revise it and solve the other problem. Somebody will say, no, no, there's a PhD student working on a solution as we speak. Mm. In Africa, you know, when you wake up in the morning, problem yes. greets you by the door. I'm yes. telling you. That's the reason why I, I'm coming here, because mm. this is where things can happen, mm. fundamentally. That brings, so the, okay. So it's about tapping into the, that, that diaspora network. I'm currently working on a few projects, uh, even with the African Union, around how do you tap into the African diaspora able to harness the capacity and the skills just for nation building. And I, but, but the point is, only one person can do that. It requires mm -hmm. some government support, some back and forth, some institutional strategy. I mean, I cannot do a little. For example, I was telling uh, BC, I've just set up a brand new mobile app. I mean, I'm just one man. Mm -hmm. But the mobile app is like a, a, one of the most comprehensive career and education mobile app you see on the continent. And it's free. It's flexible. Mm -hmm. that's, it. that's, that's basically the app. But how many people can I touch okay, in my own little way? Mm. So these things have to happen in, big, in bigger versions for there to be the impact you won't actually require requires. That brings me to uh, my point, which is we want to go out there because the ground, uh, the, grass is, the grass is greener on the other side. Really but most of them are coming here. <laughs> oh, most yes. of the uh, healthcare yes. facilities we have right now are yes. being run by Indians, Chinese. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are coming here. Now, how do we get our people to understand that we can make it here. Oh, that, that's actually, so, you know, when, when, when I see uh, my, my, my fellow brother, I say, well, why are you going to UK? So that's where there's money. Hmm. And I see the UK Body president. Why are you coming to Nigeria? I say there's money. So that means there's something mm -hmm. that the British person is seeing that, that Nigeria, Nigeria has not, not seen. seen. Guess what? I've seen it too. Why do you think I'm here? Mm. I can assure you, and it's a fact. Understand that there are societal challenges and, and, and conflicts, but the point is, if you, if you are dogged and, and persevere and understand your capacity to solve those specific solutions or professor solutions, those, those sort of problems, the opportunities are massive. Yes, the mm. continent with the biggest portfolio of problems 
is the continent with the biggest portfolio of oh, opportunities? Mm. Because gold. problems are raw materials for innovation. Let me help you with this. So, um, you know, right now we have a situation and we've understood it. Our schools, our lecturers, don't get it. They're not pushing us in the right direction. Traction. Probably because they don't also understand, understand it. it. But here we are. And not all of us can travel abroad. For those of us that are here, yeah. given the situation that we have, what can we do individually as families, as communities, to start building and creating a pathway for generations to come, come. and also that will reflect in our government, in our economy. What do we need to start I think, doing? I think, I think, I think your point you just raised is actually absolutely crucial. And I think I've come to the point in my career where I just know, because we've been waiting for government and many people to do things for a long time. Mm. I am tired of waiting. So my, my, my message now, I'm now the individual impact evangelist. That's my new message now. That's your because autom automatically, if there's little, little contributions from individuals, you make a really good point. Because everybody can add a little value, no matter how small. Mm. And the question is, if you flip it over from value for me to value for others, that is the, the bedrock of the change that we need. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 I mean, you get impact yourself, but guess what? Actual career growth is built on your capacity to give value for others. Mm. That's actually where, where you grow in career. Mm -hmm. Go further anywhere at any point in time. Anybody who actually just thinks about themselves would never grow. It's, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Mm. The big companies, is the, reason, the reason is because there are many more people that are getting value from what they do. It's called the law of replication, mm -hmm. the law of distribution. That's mm -hmm. basically what it is. The capacity for you to actually replicate yourself and give values continuously. I have a question on that replication. Let Please me tell you. Me. Because, okay. see, my, my worry is where we are where we are. It is what it is right now. So we have a lot of you in the diaspora, and mm -hmm. I would like to really see how do we tap into those abroad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good where they're not thinking about me, myself, and I. My <laughs> yes. family, I'm a doctor, my, my children, I'm like, we're okay. We're okay. We are okay. How can we use their exposure, their knowledge, their okay. resources? Yes. How do we harness that for us? How, how can they, what, what opportunities can they bring? Because it's just a, if it's just about them, we're not going to solve a problem. Absolutely. But they come collectively together and say, you know what, we are, this is our plan for Nigeria. You know, but they're actually frameworks, you know. And I, I tell people this. And, and for me, it's about, if you understand that, the fact that in the, in the world we now live, to grow your, your enhance your career, or enhance your spaces, is by partnerships. If you think you're going to go on, a, on your own, that's old school. Mm -hmm. But the point is, how many people actually really understand the value of partnerships or the partnership in the first place? Someone tell me, well, uh, how do you do partnerships? And I ask a very simple question. Partnerships begin with your, your understanding of your global self and space. So a very simple way to ask questions is this. If I ask you lovely ladies and say, so which would you prefer? If I say, hey, to, 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 to kind of call yourself, would you prefer to say, I am a Nigerian professional, okay, and I'm interested in the Africa or international market? Or B, would you prefer, I called you, I'm an international professional. I just happen to be living in Nigeria. Which, which would you prefer? Think about it for a minute. International. Uh, I, I'd like, rather be called a Nigerian than anything. International is the same. <laughs> See, thing. I, think, I think one, but two sounds better. But why did I ask the question, though? It's because, believe it or not, I mean, Morayo can be called by CNN and she will do an incredible job. Mm -hmm. So that even though she, she, she actually works in Nigeria, she's already inherently an international professional. Yes. So people actually lose the understanding of their global self mm. because they are in a local space. Mm. That's, that's where the problem comes. So partnerships. Look at LinkedIn, it's for example. It's about the impact you make wherever you, you are, are first. first. So the, uh, you, earlier when you were talking, you reminded me of a conversation I had with the former governor of Lagos about how, what people focus on in businesses. So I was once arguing, and he says I argue a lot with him, about okay. um, businesses packing up. You have to fire your fuel, your diesel, your everything, and you earn in Naira, the money is devalued. I say, Madam, keep quiet. The foreign companies that are here also buy diesel. They, they also use the bad roads. That's true. They also earn in Naira. That's true. And some still pay taxes wherever they do, where, wherever their origin is from. So think about it because you're focusing on the problem, which is what all Nigerians do. do. So is it really is it about... Is is it that simple and is it about what we focus on or, you know, whether the entire good? Because BC mentioned the particular area of business That's now. True. And these companies, even I had an argument a month ago that this is where I would rather go for my tests mm. with another Nigerian business. Yes. That, you know, because I think they do things better than you and it's even cheaper. But I haven't said that, I think I've got a point. You're very, very correct. But I guess the problem, 
what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm referring to is this. There are many SMEs who begin at doing incredible work. But it gets to the point where their geographical space now limits them. Good. Mm. That's Good. what I'm trying to make. Yes. But I'm, what I'm saying is that you are a global professional, a global SME. Just because you haven't understood your space. So I'll give a simple example. Okay, is, is somebody looking for what you're doing in Kenya? Do you know how many times I have flown to an African country? So, for example, I'm in Ivory Coast. And a vice chancellor will tell me, hey, Doc, can you find me a Nigerian lecturer? Or that, that is English speaking, mm -hmm. that can partner with us, follow me, mm -hmm. to teach English version of our French French programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you are an English teacher here, and you are saying, "Hey, I've suffered, though. but there is a, there's, there's a, a school demand for you, a demand yes, for you in Francophone West Africa. And just yeah. in West wow. Africa, there are 15 countries, That's and nine, nine of them are French speaking, yes. mm. and they are looking for you with touchlight. Mm. And you are here, you are you're complaining okay. because you don't you haven't understood your global space. Mm. Mm. I, give, I give an example. You know, I'm, 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 I'm the first I've flown to Tanzania, okay, and then I'll meet a government official, and they will tell me, "Well, can you structure a deal for us to come and learn about oil and gas? Why is that important?" Mm -hmm. Tanzania just hit a huge oil and gas reserve, reserve yes. okay? But Nigeria has been doing this for over 40 years. They need us, our so, cities. So, 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 so if you call any, any, any profession, any career space, I can tell you which three, four countries you should be aligning your, your, your target. So as a lawyer in Nigeria, if, absolutely, they're looking for me anyway. There are spaces. So if you're an IT person, if you're not speaking to somebody in Rwanda, there's something wrong with you. Whoa. <laughs> because the Rwandan government is investing in dangerous so money mm. to make themselves the Silicon Valley of the continent. You speak about mining. Mm. I mean, I can go on and on. It's about so understanding lack of information. As because well. you just put yourself, I am a Nigerian. Mm. But Africa is 55 countries and hey. over a billion people. Hey. You have launched, I'm launching a book at the end of the mm. year, okay. mm. and it's an environmental book for children. Mm. It talks about vultures, and vultures, the problems we have is the decline in vultures across Africa. Mm. Okay. But I've been thinking of that book only for Nigeria. Mm. That, mm. That's, that's where the that's where the premise is. So, 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 so by restricting your geographical space, mm. you've restricted your marketplace. Yes. Yes. Hey. I, 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 thinking, I, I, thinking global. Yes. <laughs> but, 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 so, so, wait, so, so, so the, the impact can be question. local. Mm. But I'm saying that you don't restrict the impact because we now live in a globally connected world. Mm. I live in England, but my goodness, I tour over 30 African countries. Because my, those spaces are where I delve into. The same thing with most African individuals. Mm -hmm. You're just in your own space. That, that, that lecturer who is just complaining, I don't have uh, research grant. I asked him, well, how many partners do you have in other African countries? He said, well, I don't have any. He said, but why wouldn't you? Tomorrow, when the Kenyan government announces a new grant, mm -hmm. and they tell Kenyans, researchers, that to apply for the grant, they need partners. If a Kenyan researcher had you on your WhatsApp number, you're we'll Nigerian. You. What's the first thing you would do? Mm. Okay. Yeah, okay. So every day, expand your. You know, let me let me ask my question. I have a very so last. This is please, clarity. Please. So the local impact, I said. So most Nigerians are graduating without making an impact, creating a field like you mentioned with Morayo. They're just looking to go. But that's the problem. Uh -huh. Because so that's, that's where that's I'm going. Everybody is looking at earning power. So Naira is low. Let me go and earn in dollar. Right. And you take any rubbish latrine job anywhere you go. Create local impact. True. First, create and global. global. And you say it's global. That makes absolute, absolute sense. May I absolute add that, um, I want to ask you, how do you prepare yourself for the international space? For instance, yes, one yes. of the reasons we have question. people uh, going to foreign businesses is because they receive excellence, especially in customer service. Yeah, so true. they treat you better, they know how to yes. and all that. How Did you do you answer that question in 10 seconds? In 10 okay, seconds. I can, I can. Yeah, go so ahead. to prepare yourself, my book as it's case to prepare yourself for international <laughs> space, I think the first yeah. thing is the fact that your segmentation has to be clear. Yeah. You have to outline your actual spaces of contribution, mm. Mm. Where the, where, where, what is the requirement for you. You need to be positioned in, this, in, 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 in the global space. If I Googled you, and Google is having epilepsy to find you, then we have a problem. Mm. Because that is the virtual area we now live. Mm. Fundamentally, know that, that you are a provider of solutions mm. in the global space, mm. even if you're local. Oh, we have to run. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Thank you so much.
think we I'm learned. Going global. Oh, you got to go global, yes, honey. There's lots of space for you. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, I think we can use you as an example because you have a book, you're interested in environments and yes. children, and you have a space. So don't, don't think local. Someone says, is, yeah. Bukola <laughs> says, I'm researching this doctor. He's too good. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's fantastic. That's all we can I take on the show. Book, yeah, no, we'll yeah. have a lot of that's, discussion. That's absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Absolutely. Think global. Yes, not local. <laughs>